Sun exposure is an area of health and lifestyle that receives a lot of attention for multiple reasons. On one hand, you have camps vying for sunscreen and making sure that people limit their sun exposure as much as possible, arguing that too much sun is going to impact someone's risk of skin cancer. On the other hand, you have influencers that are very pro sunlight and people who obviously promote the benefits of sun and light exposure for its circadian health benefits and the impact on our biological clock advocating for getting much more sun exposure than the average American or person living a Western lifestyle typically does. So which camp is correct and what should we be paying attention to when it comes to our light exposure? When it comes to sunlight, it's one of those things where simply getting outside, it is a free accessible tool when it comes to our health and fitness. And while you may live in varying geographies and your sun exposure may vary, when we look across the year, we can still access this tool and utilize it in our daily routines to improve our overall health. So inside this episode, I'm gonna talk about how sunlight can do everything from boost mood to vitamin D status and its impact on different longevity related risk factors, whether we're talking about neurodegeneration and our brain health or considerations like skin cancer and really what the research suggests or what it indicates based on the evidence that we have so far in humans. So the benefits of sun really go beyond vitamin D and circadian rhythms as well, um, including some interesting all-cause mortality data and melanoma data. Inside this episode, I'm also gonna to touch on sunscreen. So when we, anytime we're talking about conversation around light exposure or sun exposure, people will naturally ask, should I be using sunscreen? And if so, what kinds? So. First and foremost, we'll kind of kick it off with uh, when people think of sun exposure, they mainly think of vitamin D. And while vitamin D is synthesized from uh, getting that light exposure, or getting sun exposure, and UV rays are the main source of vitamin D for people, uh, vitamin D also plays incredibly important roles in terms of immune health and overall immune system homeostasis. It's important for bone health, energy production, mood regulation, and more. So it's not just that we're getting the sun solely for the vitamin D, it's also the downstream effects of vitamin D. And you know, then that tends to lead to the question of how much sunlight do we actually need to have adequate vitamin D status. And many people actually can't get enough from the sun alone or they're not spending enough time in the sun to actually bolster that status in and of itself. So this is a little bit of a hard question to answer outright because there will be variability depending on a number of factors. Number one, geographic location, proximity to the equator. So folks in Northern states, uh, if you're living in North America, so for example, Northern part of the United States and Canada, going to get a little bit less uh, of that sun intensity and overall uh, sunlight compared to maybe someone who's living in a more Southern region. So if you're looking at North America, like Texas, Florida, Mexico, going to have varying amounts of total sun exposure in that sense. And then also skin color can impact this. So ethnicity and skin color, darker skinned individuals will need a little bit more vitamin D than lighter skinned individuals just due to uh, the nature of that vitamin D synthesis. Where you are uh, relative to the equator going to be one of those primary risks and then just thinking of overall skin tone playing into risk for vitamin D deficiency as well. If you wear sunscreen, you also won't be generating much vitamin D. So as far as two to three main risk factors in terms of people having suboptimal vitamin D status, it will be the darker skin tones, will be uh, being further away from the equator, and then individuals who wear a lot of sunscreen or they're pretty much covering their entire body when they go outside, some people do both, and those will impact your vitamin D status. So generally, when you look at the human research, we see that about 4,000 IUs per day is an appropriate amount to prevent deficiency risk and prevent us from being at that suboptimal status from vitamin D. Some vitamin products may only be at 1,000 to 2,000 IUs. That may not be sufficient, depending on the amount of sun exposure someone gets, their skin tone, and where they're located in terms of the proximity to the equator. So 4,000 seems to be the sweet spot. You can go higher than that. If someone is experiencing a deficiency, the best thing to do would be to test your hydro vitamin D levels in your serum labs to establish uh, your overall unique vitamin D status versus basing it off of someone else's number or just what's uh, solely listed in research. Another thing we have to consider is when we're talking about sun exposure and light exposure is the importance when it comes to our sleep and circadian rhythm. 
with the popularity of other mainstream science podcasts, people have realized, hey, I need to get outside and expose my optic nerves to the sun. I need to get parts of my skin exposed to the sun. And that's become a popular trend in health and fitness. There's even online influencers on Instagram. Uh, some people are even <laughs> trying to get sun where the sun does not typically shine. Uh, if you happen to follow any of the more kind of ancestral health folks, some people are literally outside naked, you know, kind of laying on the ground, flipping their legs up and uh, trying to get some sun on their butt cheeks as well. Um, and maybe even some other areas. So sun exposure has certainly become a lot more popular and in vogue and for a number of different reasons, par partially because of the vitamin D benefits that I elucidated earlier. And then we also have the consideration of sleep and circadian rhythm. So we know that uh, total sun exposure throughout the day also aids sleep. So it's not simply just helping to anchor that circadian biology, it can support sleep. And the more sun you get, uh, the better your sleep will typically be. Uh, if you've ever had the typical beach vacation or you've gone away on a trip and let's say you normally work in an office environment uh, or a school environment, or maybe you're inside for a significant uh, a part of the day, or maybe you even work from home and you're not spending a lot of time outside. Maybe there's artificial lighting or you're like me and you're in front of this camera right now and there's more artificial light with a little bit of light coming from windows. You know, you may find that you're actually subsequently quite tired or fatigued after spending that time in the sun. Sometimes this can be due to heat and uh, loss of fluids and electrolytes. We may need to replenish that, but there's also something to be said for spending that time in the sun and the effects that it may have on sleep. So even if you weren't necessarily splashing around in the waves or being super physically active on vacation, it could have been possible that the higher volume of sun and sun exposure that you had led to a little bit of that extra feelings of tiredness and fatigue and just you know, wanting to sleep and maybe even getting more restful sleep. I would also argue that part of it is when you go on vacation, there's less stressors from daily life. And when people are more relaxed and they don't have uh, that stress and maybe, you know, you're eating a little bit differently, sometimes people can tend to just be in a more calm state in general, which naturally is going to facilitate a little bit better sleep versus having that uh, high cortisol and kind of fight or flight experience that they may be having in their daily life. Here are a few other fast facts regarding sun exposure and benefits. Sun exposure boosts our ability to produce nitric oxide, which translates to more relaxed blood vessels and better cardiovascular health. If you've ever worked out outside, you might've noticed you were a bit more vascular looking or gotten a better pump. Uh, this is certainly part of the benefits uh, from that sun exposure and getting that nitric oxide production. The sun also directly boosts the production of mood elevating endorphins. In addition, it may also boost libido and it may even suppress appetite through the release of a compound called MSH or alpha MSH. So with all of these different mechanistic and clear short-term benefits and the fact that we know that, hey, we can actually obtain some benefits from being in the sun, we shouldn't be scared of the sun. It's something that uh, can help with many different components of quality of life and just our general well-being. Let's talk a little bit about the long-term longevity and things like skin cancer that tend to lead to a lot of fear mongering and people having uncertain opinions in terms of what they should be doing when it comes to the sun. So we have several pieces of pinnacle evidence, basically review studies or randomized controlled trials uh, or review studies with meta analysis, looking at rates of mortality from different conditions in individuals who avoid the sun versus those who are actively seeking it out. A 2016 study looking at many different uh, mortality related you know, causes found that all cause mortality was doubled in women who actively avoided the sun versus those in the highest category of sun exposure. So again, mortality was doubled in women who avoided the sun versus those in the highest category of sun exposure. Looking at the disease breakdown, women who avoided the sun had a 60% increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease than women who had the highest category of sun exposure. In a different study, the highest degree of sun exposure was associated with the lowest risks of type two diabetes, as well as most non-skin cancers. So those would be things like, for example, uh, lung cancer, or if someone were to uh, be you know, at risk for something like pancreatic cancer, et cetera. The skin cancer part is a little bit more nuanced and we'll kind of get into that as we progress through today's video and audio. In individuals who already had cancer, more sun exposure was linked with increased survival rates and cancer remissions rates. 
of course, alongside with their normal standard of care. So the sun was not the sole treatment, but being in the sun did seem to help in non-skin based cancers. A 2022 study in Finnish population showed that those who got the most sunlight had anywhere from a 12 to 24% visual and verbal uh, memory improvement in terms of overall global memory, general recall, and a lower risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases. So preventing that neurodegenerative decline, getting in the sun, super important. We also know that uh, vitamin D may be playing a role here as well uh, due to its multitude of effects. And back to cancer, surprisingly, the 2016 study that I mentioned earlier in terms of those actively seeking out the sun versus those avoiding it saw no difference in melanoma mortality between those who totally avoided the sun exposure and those who had the highest uh, category of sun exposure, or basically were seeking it out the most. When it comes to skin cancer risk, like melanoma, it seems that intermittent high intensity sun exposure, so for example, let's say you never get sun exposure and then you go on vacation and you get sunburned, that would be uh, kind of that intermittent high intensity. Meaning if you're normally inside all the time and then you just go to a tanning bed or you're inside all the time and then you go on vacation, that's a little bit more risky than someone who just has gradual amounts of sun exposure every single day, or they get outside in the morning, get outside in the evening, or it's kind of spaced, right? So let's say uh, if you work from home and you're able to go for a walk in the morning, you get some sun exposure, maybe you go out a little bit midday, you come back inside, you go back out again, or you're someone who has a job uh, that's outside, you're getting more regular sun exposure versus the person that gets none, and then they have this ramped up intensity of sun exposure. Just trying to use some basic lifestyle examples in terms of where the risk factor may vary. It's not like the exact example that they used in a study, but it may help to convey the relevance of the evidence to daily life. So if you're someone who has chronic low-grade sun exposure, for example, the type you would get if you had an outside job or occupation, uh, that could actually be protective against melanoma. It does appear that cumulative skin, expo skin exposed to the sun or sun exposure in general is a risk factor for more rare types of skin cancer, such as uh, basal and squamous cell carcinomas. So at this point, you might be wondering, what about sunscreen? Should I be using sunscreen? Is that something that could even help me in this situation? Should I avoid it altogether? And um, the answer is, you know, we'll, we'll kind of break this down depending on that risk and the individual's lifestyle scenario and the different types that have actual safety data on it versus stuff that does not have human safety data. So it might be a good idea to put on some sort of sunscreen if you're going out into the sun for a long period of time and long duration of exposure, and you're someone who maybe doesn't regularly get sunlight. So for example, if you don't have that occupation outside or you're not someone who kind of primes uh, your body with a little bit of sun exposure in the morning, or you're getting regular sun exposure as the sun intensifies throughout the seasons. In the 2021 Food and Drug Administration publication, we saw um, when they were looking at sunscreen safety, they had an update to their regulations around these particular products. And really, um, they reviewed 16 different ingredients. And what they found was only two, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, were generally recognized as safe and effective. If you've seen any of my other videos or listen to any of my audios where I talk about um, GRAS or GRAS, generally recognized as safe is something that is uh, put out by the FDA when it comes to different ingredients and different products. We've talked about food-based ingredients before, but this is in terms of sunscreen. Most people I would think who listen to this are probably gonna opt for something like the zinc oxide variant. And remember, uh, people don't need to, again, kind of fear monger when it comes to the sunscreen application. Sunscreen application should be kind of individualized depending on duration of exposure, your daily lifestyle, how much sun you're getting at other points in time, your risk factors uh, when it comes to things like melanoma, and understanding that we don't want to completely block the sun or not get any sun because it actually helps to reduce risk of all-cause mortality and other causes of death in a lot of different areas. So other ingredients that lack safety data or have enough rat data combined with human data to suggest that you probably should skip out on them or completely forego these ingredients would be oxybenzone, um, homosalate, and others. Oxybenzone in particular has been shown to be a strong endocrine disruptor to impact many different hormones in rats and mice. Now, while this is a rodent study, you know, there are certain ways that this can kind of carry over. And if zinc oxide is generally recognized as safe and you can opt for that ingredient, why not opt for the zinc oxide based sunscreen versus going for something like 
oxybenzone per se. Some individuals, they're having more modest exposure or it's kind of uh, split up in terms of you know, breaking up that overall duration. They may not even need heavy amounts or application of sunscreen. Really what we wanna avoid is people who are basically inside all the time, have fluorescent lighting, go outside, get sunburnt, or have high intensity of sun exposure, and then they come back inside and they don't really have any sort of consistent light, light exposure where they're actually getting all of the other health benefits from it. So if you are someone who regularly puts on sunscreen, particularly if you're a woman already struggling with menstrual cycle health or a man struggling with lower testosterone, then it would be best to use a mineral formulation such as zinc oxide. So understand the oxybenzone, what we tend to see in terms of from a research perspective in humans, we have data linking it to the induction of allergic reactions, potentially lower birth weight in babies and lower fertility rates in general. The data is very limited here and understand. So some of the endocrine disrupting chemical data that's more in rats, uh, like rodent study in mice. And then in humans, it's more of a uh, more observational in nature uh, versus having something that's necessarily like a randomized control trial on oxybenzone per se. Now, unfortunately, the main drawback of a pure mineral formulation is that it inevitably, inevitably will leave a white cast um, when, wherever you use it. But if you can get over this, then you're probably doing yourself a favor in terms of potentially using that ingredient versus uh, something like the oxybenzone. So as a reminder, sun exposure is going to be great for vitamin D status, all of its benefits in terms of immune health, bone health, energy production, and more. We also potentially through sun exposure get the benefits of alpha MSH and potentially boost libido as well as suppressing appetite. We have the induction of nitric oxide or increased production of nitric oxide. We have improvements in cardiovascular health and also all of the circadian rhythm benefits uh, when it comes to health and sleep that we do get from light exposure. Those are things that have been kind of popularized on the internet over the past few years. So didn't want to solely focus on the circadian rhythm benefits, but certainly cannot be understated when it comes to improving your overall health and sleep. So it seems that when we get outside in the sun, it lowers most risk factors when it comes to all cause mortality and long-term disease risks, except for certain types of skin cancer. For example, we talked a little about the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, however, it doesn't seem to increase mortality from that skin cancer. So while you may develop the skin cancer, it doesn't seem to actually increase the mortality risk, meaning uh, the survivability rates or overall survival in people who are actually getting in the sun may seem to be a bit better. So again, some of the pinnacle research were basing this episode off of a 2022 study on Finnish populations. We have a 2016 study looking at different mortality rates and mortality causes that found that all cause mortality was doubled in women who actively avoided the sun versus women who were um, in the highest category of sun exposure. So there's human evidence here to support this. And we're looking at the actual research and kind of breaking it down. And then we also look at some of the 2021 Food and Drug Administration updates and what's generally recognized as safe. It seems like, you know, we do wanna be intentional about getting sun exposure and being outside, can certainly benefit from being outside. Again, it's, uh, balancing you know the abuse when some people kind of get in the sun and they're doing it in certain ways that may not be advantageous for their health it's not necessarily a part of their regular lifestyle and then they're going to the extreme of just being in the sun uh, 12 hours straight on vacation which is very different from their daily life and we also have situations where people are overusing sunscreen or completely covering their body and not getting as many of the benefits that can come from sunlight and then again, if you are someone who falls into a risk factor for deficiency, so this can happen in uh, individuals who are eating a standard American diet, who are overweight and obese, not very active, not getting much time outside. We also have to consider darker skin tones and proximity to the equator when we think about our overall risk factors for vitamin D deficiency. If this episode was helpful for you, if you enjoyed it, or you're going to use the information, either create content or share with a client, please support the show. You can support the podcast on the audio feed by dropping a five-star rating and review. If you're on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss, miss a show and you can give it a thumbs up, leave a comment to support the algorithm and helps to uh, just kind of boost the work that my team and I do here. We invest a lot of time and financial resources in putting out this information and content for you in gathering the best research and framing it in the most digestible, kind of easiest way to understand 
for the average person and for the health professional who's going to use this to help potentially coach others. The name of the game here is the ripple effect and that's not possible if you don't share the show or leave a rating and review. You probably never would have found the platform if one of my original listeners didn't share it with you, whether it was an audio or some type of video or maybe even you know sharing other social media content like my Instagram, I'm at Samler Science on just about every major platform, but sharing it goes a really long way uh, to supporting my work and my team's work. And uh, you probably wouldn't be here if someone didn't do that for you. So take 30 seconds of your day, it goes a really long way. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode and I will talk to you in the next show.